Hey, hey, fellow biophysicists. Welcome back to another episode. Today, I'm excited to have with us uh, Joe Shirley. He's a researcher at the University of Texas in Austin. And we're going to be discussing his recent paper in um, physical science titled Short and Long Range Crowding Effects on Water's Hydrogen Bond Networks. Joe, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Clark. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for getting on. So, um, Let's just go ahead and dive right into this. So I guess, you know, you guys are studying the impacts of these crowders. Can you go into, you know, what a crowder is, why we care about it, what it does? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I've, been, I've actually been talking to a lot of people, you know, out in the neighborhood about this lately. So uh, I, think, I think I've got a pretty good uh, straightforward starting explanation. So, you know, you go, you're thinking about life, right? And we know that the fundamental unit of life is the cell, or at least that's what we're taught, right? Um, and so- yeah, that eighth grade biology. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And mitochondria is the powerhouse, right? <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we, we've got our cells and um, in our cells, we have proteins and those sort of are the uh, molecular machines that biology likes to use to, you know, do catalysis and all sorts of other functions, right? We've got motion coming from those, structure, um, right, and you know, there are other biomolecules too, you know, lipids, nucleic acids, those are all important, um, but proteins are, are really interesting, right? You've got the recent news, uh, Google's trying to make the structures of all the proteins. So, you know, a lot of people are interested in proteins, um, but one of the, the difficulties, uh, I guess, of studying proteins, right, is so, so you're trying to look inside of a cell um, and look at, you know, let's see how these proteins behave, right? So you want to do some sort of spectroscopy, look at that in some sort of way. Um, but there's a lot of things in a cell, right? And so it's, it's really hard to see the protein you want to look at. I mean, even if you're doing microscopy, it's hard. You're doing spectroscopy, it's hard. There's a lot of noise. Um, and yeah, so- it's like trying to, you know, study people in a city and there's all this stuff going on inside the city. Yeah, yeah, especially, you know, imagine trying to study people in a city, but all you can look at is like plane photos. You know, it's, it's going to be hard to figure out what you're looking at, yeah. So, you know, even if you make all the people you want to look at wear red hats, it's still going to be hard to figure out what's going on. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like, where's Waldo, right? It's, it's yeah. still no idea. Exactly, you, you know, and so so the obvious solution, I guess, or, or what, what they came up with back in the day, right, is you're, okay, well, we'll take the protein we really, we care about, right? We want to know what this protein does. We're just going to overexpress it. We're going to break open the cell, we're going to spin this thing down, we're going to extract pure protein, and then let's put that in some water. Oh, you know, we'll make sure it's a buffer so the pH is right. Um, and then now we're going to look at the protein, right? So, you know, that's all well and good, right? You, you can look at the protein, you can see it. Um, the structure is probably pretty right. You know, it's like, okay, you can look. Yeah, you're at cutting protein. down on all that noise, right? Yeah, exactly. You get clean right through. There's, there's no more crowded, right? There's, it's, it's not crowded anymore. But then that's, that's the problem. You know, you start to think about that. Well, wait a minute. You know, if you've got this cell, right, it's 40% it's by volume, it's filled with stuff. And if that's all bouncing around, like, isn't that going to affect the way proteins look and the way proteins behave, right? And so, so people started to realize this was a problem. Um, There's a paper in the 80s where uh, a guy, uh, Minton, was looking at red blood cells, uh, the hemoglobin uh, agglomeration in uh, sickle cell anemia people. Um, and it, it just wasn't working out. He, he, the, when he was trying to fit the data, it wasn't working until he started saying, wait a minute, these proteins are bumping into each other, they're crowding each other. And then he was like, now the model works, right? So this crowding effect, people have known about it for quite a while, right? So, so they realized, okay, cells are crowded and that crowded nature is gonna change the way proteins behave. And so that's like, that's really important to look at. Um, and so the problem though is, you, is, so, you know, nowadays, sometimes people do these studies on proteins and they say, we're gonna put it in water with a buffer, which I, I don't recommend, um, you know, maybe for, for an initial look at, but otherwise I don't recommend it. Uh, but now a lot of times people will take and they'll, they'll have their protein in water with a buffer and then they add artificial crowding agents, right? So it's like, okay, the cell's filled with stuff. Well, let's fill this beaker with stuff. So they put BSA in there, you know, they put sugars in there, they put polymers in there. Um, and they're like, all right. So everything, you know, kind of dusty on the lab shelf, you take it and throw it in. 
Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, well, polyethylene glycol is cheap. Let's throw that in there. You know, <laughs> we got a lot of BSA laying around. Let's throw that in there, right? Um, and so, you know, that's good. That's going to cause some sort of crowding effects. Um, but it's, you know, what are those crowding effects, right? Like the, the original models talked about excluded volume, the sort of hard sphere model where uh, you have the proteins moving around and they're just bumping into each other. And that sort of bumping is going to kind of compress everything down a little bit, you know, PV work. Um, but are there like specific interactions or some like non-specific sort of electrostatics going on, right? Like what else is going on when you're crowding proteins? That's, that's kind of what we want to know. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could kind of think of the excluded volume as a more entropic effect, right? Like, so you're just restricting the amount of space that's available to whatever protein you have. So yeah, exactly. That it's going to have not maybe not exactly the same um, function or structure it did before. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, you've got these sort of different effects of things moving around, right? There's there's entropic effects. There's some enthalpic effects of you know actual collisions physically happening, right? Um, and you you have a few different things going on that that are causing the proteins to behave a little differently. So that's good, um, but you know. We can say that it's crowded, but is it crowded like a cell is crowded, right? Um, you know, and and ultimately it's not because if it were exactly if it were crowded exactly the same way a cell is crowded, then it would you wouldn't you know then you could just do the experiment in a cell. Um, exactly, it's you know we're gonna what's that joke about you know it takes a computer the size of the universe to simulate the universe? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so it's you know it's like wait a minute you know we haven't we haven't moved anywhere right so. What would be ideal, I think, right, is if, if we could understand the physical basis behind crowding in the cell, then we could make sure our artificial crowders, which presumably, you know, are transparent to our technique, um, are crowding in the same way that a cell is crowding, but not interrupting our spectroscopy or our measurement in the same way that a cell does. That's sort of what we want, right? Yeah, that's, that's the pie in the sky, right? Yeah, yeah, the pie in the sky. So, so I guess, you know, you have these different crowders, you know, exactly are you trying to look for, you know, like what characteristics of a crowder can you kind of maneuver around with to simulate the cell then? Yeah, so, you know, there's, there's size of a crowder, right? So, you know, in the cell, you've got proteins, you have things, you know, multiple protein structures, you have huge things. Um, but you've also got, right, you have hydrogen bonding capability of certain things. Uh, you've got their sort of their shape, right? You have long, skinny, um, molecules, you've got short little tiny thing, you know, you have like inorganic phosphate maybe floating around now and again, right? So you have, you have all sorts of different things. You have charged, uncharged, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, uh, long, big, and, and, and they're all going to have different sorts of effects, right? So, so that's sort of the, the playground, right? It's pretty much any, any chemistry thing that can, can exist in a solution, that's, that's what you have uh, in a cell. So that's kind of the spectrum we're working with. Um, so you just have all of organic chemistry as your as your playbook. Yeah, yeah, and so obviously uh, we can't do all of organic well chemistry. Enough. <laughs> yeah, in in our work, so we we decided we would narrow it down. Um, and sort of the lens we were looking through, right, is we wanted to see, you know, obviously we can like say here's the chemistry on the surface of this thing, here's what it does. Um, but and, and I think you'll appreciate this as we were sort of thinking like okay, what are the crowders doing, not necessarily to the proteins, right, which, you know, we know they're going to affect the proteins, but what are the crowders doing to the water? Because, you know, water is a biomolecule, right, and water is going to affect the way that proteins fold and behave. Water is going to affect the way the RNA folds and, and changes. Yeah, right? I mean, the water is all over the place, right? You just can't get away from it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there's no escaping water in the cell um, or out of the cell or, you know, anywhere. Uh, so, so we're like, okay, let's let's take a look at the water um, and see how our crowders changing the water. Because if we can know how crowders are changing the water, um, then I think that tells us a good idea of sort of what they're doing um, from a maybe a biophysics standpoint, right? Um, and so, do you know what roughly what fraction water makes up of the cell? I don't know if I know that off the top. Of my head. I feel like it's well. So I said forty percent of the. Is it? I think I said volume, but maybe I meant mass of a cell is is protein and like crowder stuff. So I guess the other- the It's not an insignificant number. I think that's yes. the- Yeah, the, mo most of it, I imagine. Um, 
Ah, no, here it is in the paper. That's um, it says it's roughly twenty eight percent by mass as well. Oh, twenty eight percent by mass. All right, there it is. Yeah, so a lot. Um, so that's what <laughs> we want. Right. Yeah. So so we were like, okay, if we want to look at how things are changing water. Um, then let's pick a few different things that interact with water differently, you know, just as a starting point, right? So um, mm -hmm. common crowding agents are sugars, um, and sugars are very friendly with water, right? You can dissolve, I think, twice as much glucose in water as there is water, right? It's, it's uh, got a solubility of, you I think, two grams per gram. Gatorade and Coke and stuff that's, yeah. you know, more or less, I'm not going to say sugar water, for, but, you know, there's a, there's a high sugar content. Yeah, yeah, I think I think they they're pushing the pushing the limit of solubility of sugar in that. Yeah, so impressive actually. Yeah, so so you've got sugar water. Uh, that was something to look at, right? It's it's used as a common crowding agent, not necessarily biologically relevant, right? Like glucose is a biomolecule, but you don't typically have cells filled with, to the brim with glucose. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, you, people would be way more energetic, right? It's, yeah. Yeah, so maybe some of us uh, are filled to the brim with glucose. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so you've got these sugars. What else do you try and tweak it? Yeah, so we, we said, okay, sugars, and then let's play off of that, right? So we can do some sugar polymers like dextran, uh, also not necessarily biologically relevant per se, but it's used, it's used as a crowding agent um, in the literature. But it's also, it's, you know, it's, you take a glucose molecule and you just glue a bunch of them together. Uh, and you've got dextran, so it's great. Now we can look at something that we know interacts with water quite a bit, and then we can look at what happens if we make that longer, right? <laughs> what, what happens if we make long glucose um, yeah. that has a little bit less uh, conformational ability, right? Because it's, it is stuck together, it has some constraints there. And then on top of that, we said, okay, well, we can also do polyethylene glycol, um, and that's uh, definitely not in biology. Uh, you don't have polyethylene glycol in you anywhere. Um, but it is used in drug delivery, and it is also used um, as a crowding agent in the literature. So that's sort of the, okay, now we can go straight to a polymer, right? This is just a polymer. We know it interacts with water to some extent. It's also, it doesn't do, do hydrogen bonding. Uh, well, kind of. Uh, it, has, it has some ethers on the back, but the interactions with Not water. Not a hydrogen bond made. donor. It's only, or, uh, or it's only a donor. It's not a, a word. It's only... Right. It only has oxygens, so it's yeah. capable of having the H bond acceptance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an acceptor. So yeah, it's not it's not hydrogen bonding in the same way that glucose is or water is, but it's yeah. it is capable of accepting that. Uh, and then there's a little bit of debate on to exactly what the mechanisms are because it's it's very soluble in water again, uh, easy to experiment on. Uh, I think there's a, some recent papers talking about some effects of why that is, but uh, I don't, we don't need to get into that. Uh, okay. And then, you know, PEG is also something, right, where you, we, can, we can look at this polymer and say it's, it's different than sugars, and we can just check out the length, right? We have short PEG, long PEG, what's the difference? Um, yeah, we've got these sugars, we've got these, you know, more branch things, we have, kind of have our idealized polymer. You know, how exactly do you measure the order of water? Yeah. Okay. So, so you, that's know, a good you know, line up like uh, kids in the classroom and be like, okay, count off. Like, yeah, yeah. We we just get a good microscope. We look really close, right at those waters, and we we say, yep, those look pretty ordered. No, we've uh, shattered the diffraction limit and just gone straight to the source. Yeah, right in there. We see the waters. It's it's actually that's. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the crown little videos. names like pets and. So. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, so. Uh, there's two parts of the paper, right? We did some experiments, we did some IR spectroscopy, uh, but what I ma mainly focused on was a simulation. Uh, so we, we did a simulation of water uh, with the crowders in it, um, and, and we used something called an order parameter, uh, specifically the tetrahedral order parameter. And this was originally used to look at sort of like a supercooled water and the structure of it. Um, but down, down at the meat of it, the order parameter is really just looking at, if you take a water, it's four nearest neighbors, how close does that shape represent a tetrahedron? Um, and if it's if it's ice, I guess typical ice, right? It's a it's a perfect one on the order parameter scale. It's it's one. If it's uh, an ideal gas or completely randomly distributed, uh, then you have something that has an average of zero, but it's a distribution. Uh, and if the 
it's more like liquid water, then this order parameter is like a seven-ish or seven and a half. Uh, there's there's kind of two lobes of, of it when you're in normal water. There's kind of a highly ordered region and a low or ordered region uh, that stick together. So. so this may be kind of a naive question, but for the your order parameter then, when you look at the four nearest neighbors, that's just any four atoms that are closest to it. It doesn't matter what species they are. Oh, it's it's the four nearest waters. Um, and in principle, you could look at the four nearest OHs. Um, is you know the four, four nearest sort of hydrogen bonding things. Uh, I think we limited it to just the four nearest waters because uh, we didn't want to go right at the interface, right? Like right where those two things were sticking together. Um, just because it's it's. Uh, yeah, I was, I was curious about that because it seems like it would be very difficult to define where the four nearest waters are if you're at the polymer backbone or whatever, you know, you don't yeah. have to base it off of. Yeah, so we, we gave ourselves a little bit of room there, sort of make a sure we, had, room. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had four waters actually nearby. Uh, okay, so I guess, you know, you have your, you have these different uh, clouders, you have your check to see what the order of water is, you know, what'd you find from there? Yeah, so we, we first were like, okay, let's just look at the order. And we said, well, this doesn't, this is, it's hard to tell anything, right? Like the order, the crowders changed the order of water in all the samples. Uh, but, you know, you're looking at a histogram of the order parameter and it's like, I, I don't know how to interpret this, um, right? It's, it's not intuitive, that's for sure. And rather than trying to like create some sort of model for this sort of thing, like, you know, to try to interpret these histograms, um, Sherry had this, this great idea. She said, well, let's look at how the order of water changes as we move you know, from close to the crowder to far away from the crowder, right? So we sort of have an interface, an intermediate region, and then like this supposedly bulk-like region. You know, They said that after one nanometer, you're in the bulk uh, sort of water, and it's just water, right? So that's sort of the three regions we looked at, sort of the first hydrogen bond shell um, away from a crowder, and then this sort of region in between. And then I think our final cutoff was at like uh, six angstroms, I believe. Uh, yeah, six angstroms is where we sort of said, now we're in the bulk region. Um, so I guess even before you kind of saw the results, what were you anticipating to see? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think, you know, we had thought, all right, well, sugar, we know that it can make hydrogen bonds with water. So we're like, well, that's going to be pretty ordered, we think. You know, maybe the spacing's not quite right. And I think, and this gets into a little bit into like the polyethylene glycol stuff. One of the ideas uh, behind the solubility of PEG is that it can create these like iceberg-like structures in the water because the oxygens are spaced the perfect distance apart uh, such that the, it'll fit right into the hydrogen bond network. So, we, you know, we thought maybe at first like, okay, you know, with the PEG, it's actually gonna have really high order when we're at the interface. Uh, with the polyethylene glycol, you know, we were like, all right, that's going to be so ordered because it's going to be just like an iceberg. Uh, yeah, because I guess the molecular pictures, you know, water is very, very quick moving around and PEG is very, very slow. So PEG yeah. basically dictates the time scale for where the water is going to be. Yeah, exactly. So the PEG is just going to lock that water in place, sort of. Um, and so, <laughs> um, so, you know, we thought that, and then we, we saw the results and we were right about the sugars, right? So, you know, the sugars seem to sort of order the water a little bit, uh, well, not order, it's, it's less ordered than bulk water, but it is, has some order to it uh, when you have the sugars, when you're near the interface, uh, because they, it, it can have strong interactions with water molecules. But when we looked at the polyethylene glycol uh, and, and the phycol to a lesser extent, um, it was very disordered near the interface. Um, it, 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 it was not ordering the water at all how we expected. Uh, so that was sort of a surprise. Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of interesting, right? Because you would suspect that it would bind. So what was kind of the rationale you had then to try and explain it? Yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, I think that the interactions, right? When you have OHs, you have donors and acceptors. So those, those sugar molecules are able to really, really interact with this hydrogen bond network. But when you have... Uh, just the hydrogen bond acceptors in these ether groups on the polyethylene glycol. We just think it wasn't having a very strong interaction and it wasn't maybe allowing the waters to really experience their full configuration. And as a result, it just sort of created this like, the waters aren't really able to interact like they normally would. 
uh, right? Because they're they're not able to move around in the same way. They're not able to make all the same orientations that they can because they've got a surface where they can only do one of the types of hydrogen bonding that they normally experience. Um, yeah, so it sounds like it's most, most in an entropic effect then, you know? Yeah, yeah. Large ensemble, the one option. Yes, exactly. That's, you, you know, you're, you're really reducing the number of configurations there. Um, and, and it would be interesting to look at this because there's some recent papers about uh, inductive effects on PEG where there could maybe, maybe the charges used in the, um, in the force fields that you use typically aren't 100% right. And there's actually bigger charges on the carbons in between the polyethylene glycol. And that sort of be interesting to see if that maybe changes that results a little bit. Uh, kind of curious, but as far as I know, no one's put those new charges into MD simulations before. So it'd be sort of yeah, a- Yeah, I mean, the force fields are always kind of uh, <laughs> tricky to figure out. Yeah. People that do that. Uh, but, you know, so you have kind of this ordering near the interface, but at the beginning, you know, we kind of talked about protein folding and kind of a neat finding of the paper is actually, you know, what we care about for protein folding is kind of far away from yeah. routers. So do you want to go into that a little bit? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting thing, right? So typically they've said like, okay, you have a crowder or anything that's perturbing water. And then by the time you're one nanometer away, you're in the bulk. Right, so that's, it's, it's the bulk, it's just water. You can put anything in water and it's, you know, as long as the distance is this far apart, then it's, it's the same as bulk water. You don't need the crowders. Um, and we found, you know, that it, these long range distances, you know, we went up to a nanometer, but easily, you know, it, the, the trend has not gone back down, um, is that the water was more ordered than bulk water, right? So in, our, in any simulation where we had a crowder, once we reached uh, these long distances past six angstroms, we had more order uh, than the bulk water. And so that was sort of this like shocking effect, right? Because more order means that the water uh, is able to, I guess, go through fluctuations more quickly. Uh, it's able to find uh, other waters to donate hydrogen bonds and exchange hydrogen bonds with more quickly. They're able to move more quickly, uh, typically, right? So, so we found more order at these far distances. And you know, what kind of effects could that have on protein folding when the water is more mobile and the water is more structured? Um, so that was sort of a, a surprising find um, is, is it ordered the water. That's kind of interesting. I wouldn't have thought that more ordered led to kind of quicker dynamics. Yeah, and, and I'm sure there's like a boat there, uh, but yeah, so, so it's uh, or, or a U sort of shape maybe, but um when you have the, the, the slowest thing about moving waters in a solution is breaking hydrogen bonds, right? Well, so, so in order to reorient, right, you have to make a new hydrogen bond, um, but where do you get the energy to make a new hydrogen bond when you're locked into a hydrogen bond network? Uh, you know, so, or, or I guess to, to break, you have to break hydrogen, sorry, I got that backwards. You have to break a hydrogen bond to move, but where do you get the energy to break a hydrogen bond? You get it from making a new one, right? And so, when you have an ordered network, the water is able to break and make hydrogen bonds because everything's sort of set up, right? It's like you've, you've got all the dominoes in a row and they're ready. You just have to like, you push it and then you can move. Um, but if things are disorganized, right? Then a water is gonna say, I wanna break this hydrogen bond, but there's no new one to make. So it can't do it, right? And so what really slows down water motion is whether or not it can make new hydrogen bonds. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the dating game, I guess, in some sense. If you, you got Tinder and you can swip, swipe through really, really quick, it's easy to find uh, more options. Yeah, exactly, right, right? The, the longer it takes you to, to look at a match, the slower you're gonna get uh, through, that, through that list. I'm sure there's some statistical physicist from 100 years ago rolling in his grave that were comparing dating apps to hydrogen bonding, but that's, that's besides the point. Yeah, that's the modern era. <laughs> so you guys have also kind of, you know, you have these MD simulations, but you know, like we said a little earlier, the four fields, they're tricky to get. How did you kind of verify what you have with these simulations is actually what we see in real life? Yeah, so there's, there's sort of two things, right? So, well, I, I, it's sort of one big thing. And this is typical for, uh, I guess, the field that's typical in our group. So we, we do, 
real experiments. Uh, MD is a real <laughs> experiment too. But, you know, we we do we work with real chemicals in a real laboratory. You know, we we, we actually have a space to go do things. Um, and so we we uh, use two two dimensional infrared spectroscopy. Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're um, you know, we excite some, some vibrational probes, we look at them, and then we wait a little time later and we look at them again and see how they've changed, right? And so doing that, you sort of, you can get some dynamics out of that, um, but we don't exactly know, you know, it's hard to say what the dynamics are when you're just looking at how these frequencies have changed. Um, and then when we do our MD simulations, we can use uh, what's called a vibrational map. Um, and there's some in the literature, the one we use is by uh, Min Cho's group, and so you take your MD simulation, you apply this vibrational map, and it will spit out um, frequencies for every single frame of the simulation. And then you can say, does do these frequencies, or I guess does the trajectory of the frequencies match the trajectory or the dynamics that we get in the real experiment? And if they match- well, I guess, not yeah, a ahead. naive question, but when you say frequency, you know, when I think of frequency, I think of something for time. So yeah. what exactly are we looking at in terms of moving in time? Yeah, okay. So I guess it's, so we have um, a vibrational probe. In this case, for this uh, paper, we used methyl thiocyanate, which uh, the, the CN bond vibrates. Um, and so we're not necessarily looking at the bond vibrating because uh, MD simulations don't do that, really. Yeah, you typically, I mean... For hydrogen, you typically have, you even use like a fixed bond length. A yeah, bond. exactly. Yeah. So, so we're not looking at that oscillating with our MD simulation because, it, you know, it's quantum mechanical. That's not going to be, our MD simulations are not going to be able to capture that very well. Um, but instead, what we look at um, is we look at the potential around that bond, right? So from our MD simulations, we can get the electrostatics. And we can look at the electrostatics for any given moment. And then we can... Uh, compare that with our vibrational map, uh, which will say, based on that electrostatic environment, this oscillator would be oscillating at this frequency at this moment in time. Um, so that's sort of the idea. That's that's how we get this trajectory. Um, yeah, that's kind of cool, I guess. You know, you like you know roughly some distribution, and you can go look up. Uh, I guess it's kind of like if you hear a word a lot being used, you can kind of assume from that distribution what the meaning of the word is. Yeah, exactly. You know, as, as long as it's been calibrated well, right? As, as long as you know that the person who's originally told you the word is knows what they're doing, then you can be pretty confident that the, the word you're using is correct, uh, right? Yeah, and it's not being used out of context or something. Yeah, in this case, the, 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 the dictionary we're using is the literature. So we're assuming if everyone else got it right, uh, then it must be right. <laughs> Bold assumptions as always. Um. But okay, so you kind of have this, uh, you have some comparison to experiment then. What exactly did you find from that? Uh, we found that the, the dynamics matched, right? So we, we had, um, you know, sort of what we said about order before, right? The water was, you know, most ordered at the interface. And then we had sort of the sugars were less ordered at the interface. Uh, and then the least ordered thing at the interface was the um, polymers like polyethylene glycol. Um, and what we found was when we looked at the dynamics, right? And remember we say more ordered is faster. Um, and so when we looked at the di dynamics, we saw that the water was the fastest, right? And it's more ordered, so that makes sense. Uh, we saw that the sugars were the next fastest, but still a little slower. And then the slowest things of all were those polymers like polyethylene glycol. Um, they were, those were the slowest and also the least ordered at the interface. And we found that both in the experiment and the simulation, uh, you, you look at the graphs and they, they pretty much match right up. Like, you know, the axis is a little different, but the, the shape is the same. Yeah, it's uh, you squint a little bit, but same trend, yeah. Yeah, same, same trend. And that's always a big win, I think, for computational people when you get something at least you see in the experiment. Yeah. Uh, so I guess, you know, what's kind of the... A big takeaway, you know, what did you walk away from this and you went, okay, now we really have a better handle on an understanding of this. Yeah, I think, I think the, to me, the big takeaway was just that, that there what, were these long range and short range effects, right? It's, is that we're starting to see, right, that if you're looking at mechanisms or, or trying to understand crowding, 
they, there's different length scales involved, you know, in addition to different uh, chemistry of a surface involved, right, or like, you know, polar versus hydrophobic, that sort of thing. Um, there's also different length scales involved. You have to look at the interface, you have to look far away from the interface, and all of these things can be affected by crowding, um, which I don't think, I don't think was fully appreciated before, the effects that crowding can have far away from the crowder. Um, so I guess, you know, kind of how far do you have to get away from the crowders before you would never feel it? So yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, and, and I think that it's, uh, I, 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 I've been asked this question before and, and I would like to, to, you know, run more experiments to figure it out. Um, Cause you know, we, we don't even see the, the order going down at all in our graphs. We, you know, we only go out to one nanometer, but when you think about a cell, the average distance between proteins in a cell or yeah, proteins in a cell is about one nanometer, right? So, so we're saying within the cell that there is no, there's almost no situation where you're far enough away from a crowder. Um, so it would be sort of interesting, I think, to, to, to go out further and just see, okay, what is the limit? You know, even if the limit isn't reached in the cell, what is the limit? Um, yeah, exactly. And I guess another kind of question too is, you know, when you do these simulations and you have PEG, you have sugars, it's only PEG and it's only sugars. Do you have any yeah. idea about what would happen if you tried to, you know, mix them together? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've really been interested in this. And I think that's that's one of the directions we're gonna go next. Um, we, we sort of, we're branching here. Uh, but one of the directions <laughs> I would like to do uh, is, is mix a few of these crowders together. Cause I think, you know, I have sort of a lot of different ideas, right? Is I think if you mixed like two sugars together, um, I think you would have something that's even a little, that's a little bit more disordered than just one sugar alone. Uh, just cause I think, you know, if you have a bunch of glucose molecules together they might be able to fit in some sort of regular ordered structure. Whereas if you have glucose and fructose, let's say, it'd be a little less ordered. So I think you'd have a little more disorder. But I think, you know, if you have glucose and PEG, I think the sky's the limit, right? Like the glucose might cause the PEG to collapse on itself, right? That's that's one thing, right? Maybe the- Yeah, maybe the I mean, you have like more competitive effects for the water's attention, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, maybe if, if it makes it so the water network is disordered, then it maybe it's too disord disordered to stabilize PEG and the PEG just doesn't doesn't hold up anymore. You know, I think I think there's a lot of things that could happen. And I'm really interested uh, to looking further into that. I, I, I drew up like seven different possible scenarios and I think there, there's more that could go on, right? So. so I know perhaps this might not be, you know, like super biologically relevant, but what happens if you were to change from water to another solvent? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I know it would have an effect, right? But I just, I wonder about the extent of it, you know, because if you have something, let's say, you know, that, that doesn't form any hydrogen bonds at all, right? Like mm -hmm. the motions, the dynamics, they're not quite so tied to the order as they normally are. You know, things are, it might just be diffusing a little bit more naturally. It might be a little more Brownian. Um, and so adding a crowder, you know, it's going to compress things, I think. It's still going to cause uh, limits in conformation. It's still going to cause physical collisions to change. Um, but I don't think it's really going to affect necessarily the dynamics in the same way um, or to the same extent because there's not that same connection between order and motion. Yeah, I mean, it would definitely be interesting to do something that was only an acceptor, only a donor, and then none of the above. So, yeah, but I mean, like you know, that's just kind of uh, for kicks and giggles, right? Not yeah. Um, but anyway, so kind of the last question that I have is, you know, what did you find was the most challenging part of the project? Yeah, I think you know, and and so for me, this was my first, you know, sort of like MD kind of on my own type of thing, um, and so I really. I think I, I've sort of made a lot of like silly mistakes, I guess, along the way, you know, I would I'd be like, all right, you know, this, this is, is challenging to me, you know, because I had not done this before. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to take some peg, I'm going to simulate it. And then it's like, all right, these results look cool, you know, it's like neat. And then, and then it's like, oh, I, the peg is too long. It's like, it's not what we did in the experiment. It's a different length. And I was like, well, you know, we'll keep that in the back pocket and uh, I'll throw that out and do another simulation. Yeah, or, keep that on the back server for... Yeah, so that's, that's just kind of one of those things I think was just like the... Uh, Sort of connecting the experiment and the theory and, and realizing that it's there's more to it than just you know running a simulation and saying, all right, this is the simulation. You, you have to be a little bit more thoughtful about that. And I think 
you know, I sort of went into it just thinking like, oh, I can do this on my own, but I really had to make sure to keep communicating with the group, make sure to communicate with like the postdocs who are more seasoned in MD, uh, that sort of thing. I, I think that's probably always how it is, you know, coming in as a grad student, doing sort of your first kind of project. Uh, you have to maybe you have to find your gurus for sure. You, yeah. You can't just dive into it without any. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that was probably the most difficult part for me was just doing and doing again and again and again. All right, cool. Well, uh, anything else you want to add or comment on? Uh, we find hmm. a group on Twitter or something like that. Oh, yeah. So uh, I guess our. Our group on Twitter, we have it. I think it's Bias Group UT. I hope, I hope that's where we are. Uh, Someone else stole your handle. Oh no. Um, but uh, yeah, I just thank you so much for having me. I think it's it's been an honor to talk on this podcast. It's been a lot of fun. I, I was a little scared. I was like, oh, am I going to be able to talk the whole time? But I think we've had a great conversation. So I, I really enjoyed that. I mean, when you talk about biophysics, the time just flies by, right? <laughs> exactly. That's I keep telling people that. All right, Joe. Well, thanks for being on the show then. Yeah, thank you so much. Tune in for the next one.